Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Tim Richards, Technical Services Manager of the Managing General Agents Association, and on behalf of the MGAA, I'd like to welcome you to our briefing this afternoon. This is being delivered by Charles Taylor on the subject of business interruption, a perfect storm in claims. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd just like to run through a few housekeeping points. First of all, please ensure your microphone and camera are turned off. If you'd like to ask a question, feel free to use the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Time allowing, these will be asked and answered at the end of the event. If we run out of time, questions will be answered post-event. The presentation is accredited for CPD points if relevant to your ongoing professional development programme. The briefing is being recorded and a link to the recording will be issued post-event together with the slides and our feedback survey. Please take the time to complete our survey. We shall take no, long, no longer than two minutes. This allows us to deliver the best possible future events to our membership. So today's briefing is on the subject of business interruption, a perfect storm in claims from Charles Taylor. So let me introduce you to our presenters, Terry Adams, Director, Specialist Adjusting, and Joe Prince, Senior Manager, Forensic Accounting. After qualifying as a chartered accountant, including a spell in working abroad in M&A, Terry came into the loss adjusting sector, specialising in business interruption and other losses with a financial aspect. Over 30 years, her experience has included many interesting and complex claims in a wide variety of business sectors, plus appointments for expert witness in court, mediation and arbitration hearings. Terry is also the membership secretary of the LBIA. Joe is a senior manager who assisted in setting up the London Forensic Accounting Team, Accountant Team at Charles Taylor. He has over nine years of experience as a forensic accountant, working with many insurers and law firms around the world and assisting in the quantification of major and complex losses in a range of industries and sectors such as energy, cyber, property, contingency and more. More specifically, he has been involved in the quantification of property business interruption, contingent business interruption, as well as other areas. So without further ado, enjoy the briefing, everyone, and over to you, Terry. Thank you, and welcome to this. I hope we're going to have an interesting discussion today. Um, the learning objectives from this, which is for your CPD, uh, by the end of this session, you should be able to outline additional factors which influence business, business interruption, BI losses, You'll be able to list additional internal factors which influence business interruption losses and describe and identify alternative or market sources for relevant data. That's a really key one. And finally, explain how to be prepared for longer interruption periods. So I'm looking forward to this and we'll see what we can deliver. This is our agenda for the day. We're going to look at the adjustments clause, really. That's the key for the business interruption claims that we're looking at right now. And our concern is that are we in a perfect storm of various factors? We're going to look at external business factors, internal business factors, uh, re the reinstatement period, apologies, that's out of order, then currency volatility, fraud, insolvency. We're going to look at some potential solutions to help you manage these, these issues. And then hopefully, as Tim says, we've got some time for questions and discussion at the end. Firstly, I want to take a couple of minutes, just very short, just to go over the business interruption claim itself. I'm sure some of you are not dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis like Joe and I, and I want to make sure that you're, you're caught up with it. Policy actually does have a definition of business interruption. There's usually item one or item A, and usually item two or item B. Item one is the loss of gross profit or revenue. That's the actual impact that a business may feel in terms of their sales activities. Sales would be the loss of revenue. Loss of gross profit is where the business makes a contribution from the sales that they make, i.e. they have to buy something in in order to make that sale. Item two is an increased cost of working. That's where the business has an opportunity to spend some money in order to prevent item one loss of profit or, or revenue occurring. That is a really flexible option for us adjusters and I believe for insurers as well, because it allows the business to continue to satisfy their customers, albeit perhaps not making quite as much profit as they would otherwise have made. There's also a third item that hangs around 
and it's basically recognition of any savings that arise as a result of this incident. So these are the savings that arise as a result of either the loss of revenue or potentially the increased cost of working. So those are the three components we're always looking out for when we're looking at a loss. The main thrust of today's talk is the adjustments clause. This clause is really useful. It's basically a flexible approach in order to find out what would the business have expected to make but for the insured incident. It isn't but for anything else. It's only but for the insured incidents. And what we're looking at is what adjustments are necessary in order to recognize changes in the business, whether before or after the business. So before had they bought a new a new uh, machine which would have allowed them to expand their activities or after the incident was there a competitor opening next door if they're a shop perhaps or a supermarket or something that would have influenced their results so the idea is that we we have that definition in the policy the idea is what are we going to be able to do in order to identify what is the expected activity that the business would have done but for this incident. So typically in the past, we would have looked at things like last year's turnover. We would have looked at the seasonality, you know, and that reflects, you know, if they are um, a Christmas decoration business, they would be very, very busy in December. If they are a gym and fitness business, they'd be very busy in January and possibly in the build up to summer, sort of May, June, as we sit now. So we would always have looked at last year as a very strong guide to a continuing business. So what we have, we, we have an issue right now, which is we have not less confidence, shall we say, in what went on last year, because we're in a very new business. But this adjustments clause is the opportunity to identify those issues and not be tied into historical performance. The adjustment clause very strongly applies to turnover, but it also applies to margin or gross profit. So if things are happening which affect the business's margin, there is an opportunity through this adjustments clause to modify that for the, for the purposes of this particular claim. So we're looking at this adjustments clause as we go through this presentation. So looking firstly at what we called external business uh, challenges. Um, I would like to launch a very quick poll before you've had any of our presentation, apologies, to see how you, um, how you are interpreting the issues that we think businesses are finding. Um, so is there a poll there? I believe you're going to have five choices. I, we also think we've modified it so that you can have multiple choices on this poll. Um, please only restrict your choices to two and we'll see. Here we go. The poll is on the screen now. Which factors do you think are most important? Please only choose two. You might be tempted to look at all of them. Thank you. I think we'll probably stop it there. So what we've got there, we had five options. The most important in business interruption claims today, according to your choices, is reinstatement issues, including contractor shortages. So that is a very big influence, and I would agree with that in terms of the influence on business interruption claims we are seeing right now. Oh, we've had a, a late a late pressure, inflation pressures on margin and sales. That's at 60% of all your choices. This is going to add up, I hope, to 20, 200%. So inflation pressures are the most important. Reinstatement issues the second. Then we've got a tie between Brexit currency and labour shortages and the cost of living squeeze, which is utilities staff costs and strikes. And then finally, there's a, there was an option to look at sector specific factors, but the, I think the other four are obviously rating a lot higher. So that's very interesting. Thank you very much for that. So looking at these, these external business challenges, I've got a graph in front of you there, which is look, just comparing how a selling price for a certain product mirrors the raw material cost. This is actually um, a pork meat supplier into a, a, a supermarket and they will have a contract which very much reflects the market price of those items. So if their raw material price, the price of producing the pork goes up, they are allowed to increase their selling price to the supermarket. And you can see it does follow fairly closely 
But if you look at the more recent um, data for, for later in 22, the gap was getting a little bit bigger. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, necessarily mirroring perfectly. But that is a, a very key point to make, that a business that has exposure to different costs, i.e. the cost of production, may not have the ability to change their sales price at the same time. There may well be a lag. Although they may be experiencing more costs, their, their customers certainly don't want to see a price rise every week and will not necessarily be keen to follow that price rise into their final selling, their own purchase price. So we have a difficulty about what is happening in these businesses in terms of selling prices. We also have a difficulty about COVID, and I'm not talking here about businesses claiming for COVID. I'm talking about businesses which have been affected by COVID, which means that back into 2020 and 2021, we don't have very good data as to what their regular monthly sales might be. You'll all recall that for quite lengthy periods in 20 and 21, places such as termed hospitality, bars, restaurants and the like had severe restrictions. Sometimes they were closed for any internal dining. Sometimes they were restricted in terms of their space that they could use for dining. Um, and issues about whether they could actually manage takeaways were very different. So what was going on in 20 and 21 doesn't give us a very good timeline, a baseline for what their sales might be. Those businesses will be very much pushing for an adjuster or an insurer to accept that 2019 is the last clean year and that will be the, the base level. However, we can see that what these businesses were doing in 2019 is not necessarily what they would do in 22 and 23. I've seen some businesses that are still decimated 50% or more because they haven't recovered their customers post COVID. Others are recovering and certainly in 2022, our experience of restaurants is they started the year a little bit ropey, but towards the end of 2022, business has returned to some form of normality and certainly the seasonality based around things like Christmas entertainment has come back uh, to quite a degree. So we have difficulties with COVID working out what the baseline might be but that doesn't mean to say we can't get there we also have challenges arising from brexit so brexit arose in in 2021 we were exposed to a new set of rules about importing exporting anybody importing product into the uk as part of their cost base will have experienced both um, price rises but also a cost, uh, price rises because of the costs of doing um, business in the UK. Importers have had to produce extra paperwork. There were severe delays in terms of um, just getting through Dover while they worked out how this paperwork was going to be covered. So there have been some really big impacts from Brexit purely just on the supply chain. We're all very aware as well, we know from the pound in our pocket about inflation. Some individual items have gone up extremely highly, like, like particularly food. And although it's not necessarily strictly inflation, it's the cost of utilities have certainly gone up. That's also to do with the supply side of that. So we've got exposure in terms of inflationary pressures, both on costs, and then businesses will want to Im introduce those into their sales. So we've got a very tricky matching position between the two. And then finally, we've had some fairly extended periods of industrial action that affect very, very many businesses, whether it is uh, transportation, um, just getting things around, whether it's trains or lorries or the like, whether it is um, strikes which have prevented business people from moving around, that basically industrial action is creating a squeeze on the activities of various businesses. So we have those four challenges that are external to the business. It's quite a big challenge. They will affect both the potential sales and the potential margin that the business can achieve in respect of their, their activities. So it's very tricky to work out what is the likely output for a business post um, any incident they may have had. Ooh, excuse me, internal. I'm going to move on to internal factors. These are the ones that the business has themselves. So these are particularly sector specific things like commodities in the global market, where they are. Oh, could we remove the poll from the screen? 
I think, Terry, the poll is removed from everybody's screen. Oh, except mine. Except yours. So I think you can... Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I just suddenly noticed it. That's yeah. fine. So we're, so we're looking at um, commodities when a business has to buy commodities which are exposed to the marketplace. What does that do for them? And we also have issues around savings. So when a business stops um, some element of their, biz their activity, we would expect to identify savings, you know, that third point. But history is much less of a guide now because both um, activities have changed, but also the costs of those uh, underlying items, particularly utilities, have been, what should we say, misbehaving. We've also got pressures on business from the availability of skilled labour. The graph you can see looks at UK job vacancies, and you can see that obviously with COVID, there was a very deep decline. Businesses were basically stopping doing anything, but the recovery has been very dramatic and businesses have struggled possibly because of Brexit, possibly because of these, um, what they call young retirees, possibly because of all sorts of other factors to, to fill their job vacancies. That means the business, while they might have had a very strong business activity, still struggles to get their output out. They need people to actually make the product or sell it. So skilled labor is, is a very a big challenge for businesses. We've also got challenges around the value at risk for business interruption. That is where a business has to predict, first of all, how long are they going to be exposed and what value are they asking insurers to underwrite? That is a very big challenge at the moment. So. All of those, all of those factors really give them a big challenge in terms of their internal tasks. All of these factors come together, it's a bit of a perfect storm again, to lengthen the period of the interruption. It's much harder for a business to recover, it's much harder for them to reinstate their building, we're going to look at that in a moment, and there are challenges over availability of staff and skills of staff available. So we are facing big challenges, not just after an incident, perhaps a fire, but also how the business can react to that fire and recover from it afterwards. So in this slide, I'm looking very briefly at longer reinstatement periods. We are very concerned about what we're seeing in respect of um, these, the recovery period, the repair periods. Um, many building materials are two to three times as long to, to obtain than they were before the pandemic. There are labour shortages in the construction industry and we've seen an increase in contractors who decline to tender because the risks for them are too big. They don't want to be committed to any kind of tender. So we have a longer reinstatement period which then combines to increase the potential business inter interruption because it goes on for much longer before the business is in a position to recover under its own steam, as it were. So we do have some very big um, issues there, um, particularly in terms of, of whether they can actually manage this, the repairs as well as they used to before. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Joe, who's going to carry on for the second half. Thank you, Joe. That's okay. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. Um, so factor number four is currency volatility. So uh, as everyone knows, over the last couple of years, uh, currency has been extremely volatile. You can just see from this graph here that's on the screen, it's the, the British, British pound to the US dollar. And you can see that since kind of the, uh, the beginning of 2020, it's been going all over the place. Um, and there's a number of factors, obviously, that everyone knows, um, some, some being political uh, areas, which I, I won't go into that have caused the, the different fluctuations. But it's not just the US dollar and the pound that's been fluctuating, it's, it's, there's a whole host of different currencies there. And this currency fluctuations have a operational impact on the business. So the timing of any incident to the insured is or can be extremely important. So if you've got a business um, and they've got sales in one currency and they've got imports or, or their costs are in a different currency, um, then there's going to be an impact there on the gross profit. Um, so, for example, if the costs um, were in, say, say, euros and those costs have increased and they're selling in pounds, uh, their margin is going to be squeezed. Um, but one example I have at the moment 
um, which which actually goes the other way. It's a, it's a loss in Armenia and the local currency there is of the Armenian drum. Um, their costs are actually in US dollars, um, but their sales are in Armenian drum and they are a power supplier, so they buy, buy gas in US dollars. And what's happened there is their costs have decreased, but their, their revenue stayed the same. So they've actually increased their profit there. And when you have that, you have a whole, uh, the issue there around, as Terry mentioned, the value at risk and whether there's adequate insurance. There's, there's some ways that the insured might be able to mitigate any currency volatility, um, be it hedging or, or other, other areas, but uh, that's a kind of a whole conversation for, for another time. So in terms of the policy impacts then, so when we come to currency, it's what does the policy say? Sometimes policy gives us a little, little bit of detail there, um, be it the date of loss or on, on average price, but there's sometimes there, there it isn't clear. Um, and with currencies being unpredictable, um, there could be vast swings in, in any payment. So as well as that, we've got issues between any master policies versus any local policies. So in, in terms of that, there might be issues in terms of collective payments, especially if there's any co-insurers or reinsurers um, that are, not, are worldwide rather than one location. And so when or, or how is this converted into a specific currency and who bears that risk as well as that there might be a deductible in say the global hq currency but the the sales and everything in a different currency and so again um there's there's issues around there about um currency conversion and what should that be but with the significant swings it can go uh, one way um or another to be honest in terms of increasing or decreasing uh, impacts uh, I'm going to move on now to the, the next slide, um, which is uh, factor, factor five, which is fraud and insolvency risk. So especially at the moment with, uh, with inflation, with everything that's going on, there's an increase in economic pressure. Um, you, can, you can see by this, this graph that um, come to, to 2022, there's uh, more and more companies are uh, kind of increasing, increasingly becoming insolvent. So that means where they don't have enough money to, to, to pay for goods or services um, that they're, they're purchasing. So particularly when you have this economic downtime, and this might be leading, leading on to the impacts that they've had from COVID, but there's an increase to, to, to provide a fraudulent claim, or there might be an increased temptation to provide a fraudulent claim. Um, from some research, so from the, the National Audit Office, um, in 2021, 40% of all crime was fraud, um, which is only uh, of that there's been a significant increase in cyber fraud. Uh, and you only need to look at the news to see different um, cyber fraud that's taken place, both in terms of extortion, but uh, in terms of other areas as well. We've got the, the combined issue here in terms of the COVID package. So that was estimated or support package for COVID was 350 billion. Um, so some companies are still struggling or, or they might have got a bounce back loan. Um, that was so in total 47 billion um, pounds worth of bounce back loans were offered in the UK. Uh, estimated 17 billion of them will never be paid back. So you might have the added pressure that uh, Companies have taken out loans for for, for COVID, uh, increasing their their risk of insolvency. So, when you've got a company that is a, a, an increased risk, timely payments in terms of uh, any loss uh, are quite key. Um, as as failures to make these timely timely payments could uh, have further implications down the line. Uh, we're going to move on to the, the next slide now, which is a, a summary. So. Here, uh, as, uh, as Terry and, and I have, have put out, have we got perfect storm? Um, we've got issues in terms of the gross profit. So we've got the, the inflation of costs. We've got the impact of COVID on trends and on the adjustment. The, the impact of currency and the currency issues there. We have increased savings, uh, or sorry, increased costs and savings. So is it cheaper to to repair rather than replace them, but is it is it economical to do so? You've got increased costs versus additional increased costs. So a whole host of factors there. 
uh, and then we have savings so we've got are we seeing um, some sa sa savings in labor um, and at this point I just want to stop there and, and launch the next poll um, to see your thoughts on on this to see if we are or if you've seen uh, any uh, lower savings in staff and uh, there's, there's either yes no or, or not applicable so I'll just uh, leave it there just for, for everyone to, to put an answer in. Okay, I think we're I think we're ready with that. So we're going to launch the results. 45% thought they were not seeing lower savings in staff. That may be the double negative issue. But um, so they are not seeing lower savings in staff. 25% saying yes, but 30% are saying either not sure or not applicable. So... Um, I would say that, that we we are seeing lower savings in staff because people are not getting rid of their staff. Yeah. So that's the poll anyway. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. So uh, I think there there's there's the implication uh, as Terry pointed out in her slides earlier of it's more more difficult to attract talent, and so especially in uh, industries like retail um, or hospitality, you're seeing that people don't want to get rid of their staff because they'll struggle um, getting staff, especially if they're any good. Um, so going back to the slide then, um, in terms of savings, we've got savings and utilities. Um, there's a, there's a, even an issue there is how, how, how do we calculate these savings if uh, we've got an increased inflation on prior year as well, uh, as, as well as general overheads. Um, other, other items include the indemnity period, as Terry pointed out, are, is this being extended uh, or is the is it adequately insured uh, in terms of the maximum indemnity period but also in terms of the value which leads us on to the value at risk there and lastly we have sector specific and uh, specific uh, items here so here um, we, we talked about a whole host of things such as inflation and brexit but if we just talk about say um, agriculture we're seeing that obviously um, exporting from the UK has is, is got more more expensive for for some customers in the EU and vice versa the other way. So th there's issues around that. We've also got uh, in terms of central retail, we've got issues with the, the Ukraine war, um, for example, sunflower oil, um, and how either that's driven up the price of substitutes or it's driven up the price of sunflower oil. So there's a whole kind of host of um, implications in there in terms of a specific industry knowledge um, that's kind of affecting certain items. So if we move on to, to the next slide. So what are the potential solutions then? So it's it's becoming increasingly more and more important for Terry or for, for any adjuster um, or, or even insurer to have a good working relationship with the insured. And, and it's becoming more and more important to be collab collaborative uh, and to establish a relationship with them um, and uh, communication, constant communication uh, and updating them. We can also use external uh, third party or, or market data. So this includes government statistics, um, STR data for hotel claims or peach tracker for hospitality claims. Um, there's, there's a whole host of industry data uh, available. Um, out there, some of which the insured purchases them themselves. So I've, I've worked with uh, milk industry um, in South Africa and they have their own data where basically all the milk providers um, will contribute, contribute their data into one source um, and then it gets redistributed um, obviously without saying who has what market share. But um, So there's a whole kind of host of data out there. And the insured is often the best person that knows what the data is or might even have access to themselves. So we also have to take every claim on its merits. You can also get a uh, qualified BI adjuster or forensic accountant uh, like Terry or myself. Um, but uh, we can use our kind of experience or, or knowledge from other claims, um, especially when it comes to what are the expected costs, what are the, what is a typical rate of gross profit in a hotel claim or um, what is the occupancy rate of a hotel um, or that might be area specific as well um, or in power losses um, understanding certain certain items there the the last point on here 
is to uh, kind of have effective policy cover. So it's important for the insurer to understand what's 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 being covered. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's extremely important. So uh, the learning objectives then, just to summarise before we kind of hand it over to, to everyone else for questions. So in terms of the law and learning objectives, hopefully now you should be able to outline additional factors influencing the BI losses. You should be able to list additional internal factors influencing BI losses. Describe and identify any alternative or market sources of relevant data and explain how to be prepared for longer interruption periods. So that's that done. I kind of uh, hand back to well to Terry as well, and kind of over for over to you for for any questions. Okay, so uh, feel free anyone to uh, just um, put a question in the chat now, or if you'd prefer, come off mute and uh, just ask it live. So uh, we'll just give you a, a a minute or two for that, just to ask any questions. But a great opportunity. So just type them in or come off mute. Got a question for you, oh. for you, Terry. So um, you you asked the poll earlier, uh, the poll earlier in terms mm. of what's the the most um, uh, most impacting issue at the moment that, that that everyone else is seeing. What is the most um, what's the the biggest impact that you, you are seeing, um, whether it's inflation pressures or or Brexit or I I think it's a combination. I think it's a combination of how long does it take a business to recover? You know, if they've had a major property damage that repair phase is seriously impacted by all the factors we're seeing but also the business itself is very vulnerable I think to uh, the labour pressures particularly their margins are squeezed um, that's almost to some benefit to insurers it means when they make a loss their losses are not as big as they were but their their savings in respect of labour are less um, and these losses can go on for longer and be harder to recover from. So I do think claims are edging up and are quite challenging for businesses to manage. Business interruption is always a very challenging situation, but uh, these other factors are really coming to, to pinch the managers quite strongly. And we've just had a question in from um, Stuart, uh, Stuart Dickinson, who says, so can you summarise the difference between increased cost of working and additional increased yes. cost of working i really like that one shall i go so an increased cost of working is defined in the policy as an additional cost which is incurred specifically to prevent or reduce a loss of revenue but it is constrained by it must be economic so you cannot spend more on, on the cost than it saves in respect of the gross profit. That's an absolutely underlying factor. You will have probably heard the term spend a pound to save a pound. Additional increased cost of working, and by all means do check the policy wording because it isn't always consistent, but additional uh, increased cost of working often lifts that economic limit. Um, it uses a term, it talks about reasonable costs, not economic costs by co comparison to, to the margin. I still think that the reasonableness can be measured against the sales value. You know, we don't want to be absolutely ridiculous and throw loads and loads of money and have no great benefit from it. But it just takes a little bit of the pressure off a business taking that decision um, when they're making that decision, they don't always know whether it will be successful and therefore economic or whether it will be, you know, something they felt they had to attempt and had a bit of an impact, but wasn't entirely successful in terms of the gross profit it secured. So always read the always read the policy RTP, though, because I uh, increase costs, uh, sorry, additional increased costs of working can have its own very specific definitions. But. Joe, just, you agree? Yeah, mm. yeah, I agree with that. Just to add an example to that. So, um, for example, um, I've got a fish and chip restaurant. Um, they've unfortunately had a fire. And so they have built a temporary fish and chip um, kind of takeaway van um, to help mitigate the sales. So, yes, we've got to do the testing, whether it's economic versus uneconomic. But, um, but in this case, they've, they've had that additional cost to save them the loss of revenue. So it's it's an increased cost of working. If um, you're talking about something else, say they they uh, did 
um, uh, marketing is always a grey area. Um, but if they did, say, put brought loads of leaflets um, and just handed those dis those leaflets out, and it, and it turned out it didn't have much benefit, then there's an argument there that that isn't an increased cost; it's an additional uh, cost to the business, this additional increased cost. And there are often restrictions on the AIC yeah. review as well. You know, maybe so much per month or in three months or limits, but. I think it's it can be useful to have. It takes the pressure off an insured holding the risk of whether an increased cost is economic or not. Um, but very often these businesses, they know what will work and what is a valuable and effective increased cost to incur to protect their business. So, yeah. yeah, good question. Thank you. I've got a, another question here, Terry. Uh, I'll direct it to you first. Uh, so since the COVID Brexit and the Suez Canal, um, there's mm -hmm. difficulties of source in the building materials. Yeah. Um, has there been an increase in indemnity or have you seen an increase in indemnity period inadequacy? Uh, in, inadequate, yes. I'd say yeah. we, are, we are seeing, I would think, more businesses bumping up against and possibly exceeding the indemnity maximum indemnity period they, they've chosen. I mean, Joe and I will, will, I think, be common in saying we do not like a 12-month MIP. It's yeah. all, small losses, absolutely fine. Major losses is never going to be big enough. But I think we're seeing more businesses get closer to, say, 24 months, which before COVID, for many straightforward businesses, retailers, you know, the um, fairly boring commercial boxes on an industrial estate, 24 months could have been thought to be suitable. But we're now seeing a lot of delays. And the 24 months is not just the repair period, it is the recovery period for the business. So you have to have repaired their premises, reinstated all their plant machinery and allowed them to gear up, which includes getting their customers back. So that can be quite a long period. Um, and 24 months for a major loss is getting a bit tight for some, some of the losses we're seeing, or they're getting closer to it, which is not comfortable. So, uh, yeah, I'd agree with your comments there. I'm seeing there's, there's always that delay to the start to get things moving, um, which is then, yeah, it's, it's putting an increased kind of pressure on them and the squeeze on them to get, mm. get it all up. Um, I've got a, another question here. So can adjusters do more to help educate brokers um, for longer indemnity periods? Um, I, I, I'll take this one to start mm. with, Terry. But, um, but yes, I think there's a, there's definitely a lot more um, adjusters and forensic accounts can do to have discussions with brokers. Uh, I'm always open to have discussions with brokers. Um, but uh, I think with the indemnity period, uh, it needs to be a conversation with the insured themselves. Um, so whether this is brokers um, with their insured or uh, via a third party, but it's how long will it take them to get back mm -hmm. up if they have that, 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 that major incident? So that, that's what needs to be un understood. And it, it's always difficulty in terms of the uh, source in those materials uh, as, a, as an adjuster or a forensic accountant. We're not, we're gonna, not going to know those lead times. Mm -hmm. But in certain industries, when you've got specific equipment, especially specialized equipment, um, it, it's quite easy for the insured to go to their manufacturers and ask them how, how long is the lead time of that equipment, um, especially if it's a machinery breakdown. Um, and so they can gauge from that uh, how long their maximum indemnity period should be. Have you got anything to add there, Terry? No, I'd agree. I mean, I think Joe and I have done lots of training for brokers, but the critical thing is to make it part of that renewal process where, where it's an active discussion. And it isn't just how quickly can you repair the building. It's once you've repaired the building, will your customers come back? Because it, it, that, that extra phase is quite challenging. Um, yeah, and, and the worst thing is for the likes of Joe and I when we're adjusters is that's what we find. We inherit a claim that's happened, crystallised, if you like, the policy, and we find that there's just not enough and there's not much we can do at that point. It also curtails the amount of increased cost of working you may be able to look at. You know, the shorter the period you are protecting, the less economic limit you have. Whereas if you have a third year, you can be saying, well, if we lost our customers in year one and it takes us however long to get them back, you need to be getting them back before the end of the indemnity period to make it effective to spend money. And that might include a discount or some kind of promotional activity to encourage them to be uh, loyal to the business that's had the loss. So, 
but yeah. Good. Thanks, both. That seems to be uh, all the questions we've got at the moment. So uh, do feel free to, to send through any additional ones. Uh, Terry, it's probably worth moving on to the contact details screen, which yes. is the next slide. And uh, I don't know if either or both of you have got any uh, final thoughts. No, but we're always interested in a bit of feedback from, from um, the, the likes of people receiving claims in and how they're finding it. But the factors that we're looking at are constantly changing, constantly moving, and it's um, very challenging position to be in but but quite an interesting position we're certainly not looking at last year plus two percent which perhaps we were before covid <laughs> so. yeah no i I'd, uh, I'd agree with terry so any feedback um, i'm more, more than happy to, mm. to take these conversations or questions offline so uh, feel free to contact myself or terry um and but yeah no thank you very much thanks for for having us present to be honest yeah that's it's been a pleasure Great, thank you. And you can see the uh, contact details on, on screen there. So feel free to send any uh, any questions through. And um, in the meantime, we will be sending out our feedback survey as well, just for any general feedback within the next few days. So please take the time to complete that. So just remains for me to say thanks so much for your presentation today, Terry and Joe. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Don't forget to provide your feedback, as I say, and look out for forthcoming MGAA events. I hope you all have a productive afternoon. Thanks again for joining us and see you soon.